Um, so myself, my name is Abdul Rahman, and uh, I have with me, I don't know if you can see, you want to come in? Uh, uh, Tamim. Tamim is a uh, half his year. We both are, so we are not funeral director. Uh, we are here in Bay Area. And uh, we, uh, our, our local masajid here takes care of the gusul basically, and work with the funeral director to get the paperwork. And, uh, and so we have been doing this uh, gusul and also uh, work with the family to get their paperwork in order to speed up their paperwork. So we've been doing this for last more than 10 years myself and uh, same with uh, brother Tamim here. So basically we are volunteers. We started off, uh, you know, uh, 12 years or 14 years ago, one of my friend passed away. So I was there uh, doing my first gusul then. And then there was a need in the community for giving gusul. And so uh, I started doing that. And uh, Tamim also joined me 10 years ago. So we've been doing that <laughs> since then. Uh, so, so there are a lot of things that go after death, like uh, Brother Raman mentioned. And so I'm going to basically go over, you know, after the fact, when a person passes away, uh, we get a call. So our masjid here, um, there is one masjid here in Bay Area. That's where I'm from, Fremont. There are over 60,000 to 75,000 deaths that we see in a year. And they are uh, all in the men, women, stillbirths, you know, um, and uh, young adults, all kinds, gunshot wounds, uh, and all kind of unnatural deaths all come here into our mas masajid. So, Wait, did you so, say 60 to 70,000 deaths? Yes. Okay. Just want to check. Uh, so 60 to 70,000 deaths. So, but in the Bay Area, where, you know, California Bay Area, we have uh, three masajids that offer gusul and work with the funeral director. Uh, we have a facility in the masjid. Uh, which I will show in a bit uh, uh, that uh, we do gusul here and work with the funeral director. So, so what I plan to do uh, in the next 20 or 30 minutes or, or 10 minutes is to go over the slides. Uh, let me share my slide. Actually, before you get to that, a question just came in. Sure. Did, what are the names of the three masjids that you just referenced? So the Lauri Masjid is the one that I, we are associated with. There is, uh, it's called... Uh, uh, Islamic Society of East Bay, Islamic, yeah, Islamic Society of East Bay, which is in Fremont. The other one is in MCA, uh, which is in Santa Clara. And also we have one in Oakland and there are other places as well in Stockton, as well as in Sacramento. So, so, so here we see around 60 to 75,000 a year, basically. And sometimes in a week, there are four or five uh, and for men, so so the men team takes care of the men, and then we have a women team that takes care of the the women uh, women gusul. Uh, so we have three morgues. So let me share my screen. So what I'm going to go through is is basically what it takes uh, to do the paperwork, the cost, and and uh, and also we can jump into the practical aspect of gusul and kafun, inshallah. So this is the, it's, it's called Lowry Masjid or Islamic Society of East Bay. So basically I'm going to go over these, uh, the basic the process that involves the do's and don'ts. You know, many people, uh, you know, these are key to note, you know, uh, and then we can jump into the gusul and shrouding, uh, shrouding inshallah. Basically shrouding involves, involves the kafan. So basically what kind of we see uh, ups, uh, so the kinds of death, basically we have natural deaths where uh, the people uh, generally, uh, they pass away naturally due to, uh, you know, their long life or old age, or some could be uh, due to illness uh, and they've been in hospital for a long time. So they all fall under natural death where you need a death certificate eventually. Then you have stillbirths uh, where you, you lose a baby before or during delivery. Uh, and there are two categories under, under them. Uh, one is less than 20 weeks, and then you have the 20 weeks and above. So the one, the one under less than 20 weeks, you don't need a paperwork, basically. For anything about 20 weeks, uh, you know, still birth early, later, or, or term, uh, you will need a paperwork. And then you have unnatural death, uh, you know, due to accident, gunshot wounds and all that all that so all so these are the three kinds and 
to bury an individual, you would need a burial permit. And, and to get a burial permit, the funeral director would uh, you know, reach out to the doctor and, it, and, and the doctor is the one who is supposed to uh, state the cause of death. Merely stating, you know, heart attack is not going to give a, a, give a, a, a burial permit. It needs to be an underlying condition that resulted in a, in a heart attack. So, so these are the three uh, kinds of deaths that we see. And the one under less than 20 weeks, uh, you don't need a paperwork. And sometimes in the hospitals, you know, the Christians or anyone, they send it to the incinerator. They just, you know, they just, uh, you know, burn, burn them off. But as Muslims, we can ask the hospital to give, uh, you know, give the, you know, due to miscarriage, uh, the, the, you know, stuff to the, the family and they can bury them in their backyard. Uh, and, and this is all, again, these are all, uh, what is, uh, you know, these are all what happens here in California and it can vary from state to state. So, and real quick, so to get a death certificate, um, that's usually something that um, the hospital or the, the funeral home provides, right? Yeah, it comes from the county. So basically on the day of the death, you get a burial permit two weeks after the, the, the death certificate will be mailed. Gotcha. So that's okay. what happens. So, so the key things here, do's and don'ts, don'ts, this couple of things that I've listed here, and it's very critical to know, unnatural deaths, you know, as soon as, I mean, unnatural deaths could be car accidents, you know, or gunshot wounds, any kind of an unnatural death, it could also be at home, you know, a person is suffering from high blood pressure for a long, many years, and then one night they pass away. So the first thing that you're supposed to do is call 911. And, and as soon as the police uh, arrives, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to send the disease to the coroners. And this is where we need to be uh, careful. If you know that a person has been suffering, uh, you know, high blood pressure for a very long time, you want to immediately reach out to your doctor and, and get him involved right away and make sure that the police doesn't send the, send the deceased to the coroner's office. You know, so those are the things which you have to keep an eye on. Or if a person is suffering for a long time, you need to make sure that your medical records are updated all the time. You are in touch with the doctors all the time. So in case of any unnatural death, you are there to call your doctor and, and, and uh, prevent that individual being taken to the coroners. Because as soon as, as soon as it goes to a coroner, they're going to do an autopsy. And that's what you don't want to do. So, so we have to be very careful when, uh, when in case of any unnatural deaths, uh, you don't want uh, a coron uh, you don't want the disease to be sent to the coroners. So that's very important. And get the 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 medical records updated. You don't want, you want to see the doctor often. You don't want to, you know, uh, because what happens is when a person passes away, and if you call a doctor, the doctor is saying, I, the doctor is going to say that I don't know. You have never reached me. You never. Uh, uh, you know, visited me for such a long time, I will not be in a position to give a cause of death. So when none of the doctors will be available to give cause of death, and that's where the coroners come in place. You know, the coroner is going to do an autopsy and find the cause of death. The, the reason is, the why they have to do an autopsy is, you know, you, you have to, it could be a, it could be a drug, it could be a death due to drug, or it could be for any unnatural reasons, you know. So the, so the coroner is going to do an autopsy. He's going to cut open the chest and the head. And, and you know, sometimes they lose parts. And sometimes coroner's, coroner's offices are flooded with uh, dead bodies. And they stack, they stack more than one in a morgue. Sometimes three or four are, are stacked in the coroner's morgue. And, and you don't want you know, Muslim brothers or sisters to go through that. So the first thing is that I generally tell or advise people here is, to visit doctors often, keep your medical records updated and have, be in touch with the doctor so that when you, at time of death, you can reach out to the doctor and the doctor is there to tell, I can, I'm ready to uh, sign the cause of death. It's only when a doctor is ready, you are able to get the burial permit. And it's only with the burial permit, you are able to bury uh, the disease. So it's very important to get the medical records updated. If the parents are alone, I suggest not to leave them alone. I have seen 
uh, parents who have passed three days ago, just because no one is there to take care, he, he passed away alone in his home. And it's three days later, a son or a, do a daughter comes in to find out that he's already passed away. So never to leave parents alone. And like, you know, brother, uh, uh, Rami mentioned, you know, we even in Bay Area, we don't have any uh, uh, elderly homes, you know, or any, you know, any care facilities where uh, elderly can be taken care. So if you have an elderly parents, it's, uh, it's safe to keep them with you, you know, and, and, and never to leave them alone. And yeah. then students, uh, you know. On that note, yeah, especially making your house or whatever house your parents are staying in uh, slip proof. So like, having rubber mats on the floor, railings, uh, easy to get around. Like that's super, super, super important because floors can get wet. It's very easy to slip. Um, and yeah, it's always important to make sure that those safety things are implemented true, as well. True. And then in Bay Area, we see a lot of students, Uber drivers, they are on job working 24 hours, night shifts, day shifts, and they, they go through accidents and they get, you know, some, some you know, um, have heart attacks. And, you know, what happens if you don't have any information with you, they are going to send it out to any other, you know, um, Christian, um, uh, Christian churches or any contacts that these hospitals or coroners that they have them, they send these Muslims there to, you know, to, you know, uh, cremate them. So, so students and Uber drivers, you know, many of them, we are, you know, key thing is keep someone informed where you're going, what you have, have something written down, you know, have it in your wallet. That way uh, they can reach your friends and family and then a proper Muslim uh, burial can happen. And then the last one, the important thing is, you know, request comes all the time. I want to, you know, uh, transport them to India, Pakistan, uh, or Bangladesh, you know, or a different state, just because there are other uh, uh, dear ones are buried there. The, the one key thing that, that's important here is embalming. So when you uh, ship or transport any deceased, embalming is required. Embalming is basically, it's a process where they take out all the fluids from your body and uh, put in formaldehyde, fill it up with formaldehyde, which prevents the decaying of the and deceased and so and also these formal uh, formaldehydes are very you know uh, cancerous water soluble so you don't want that to happen you don't want your body to go through all those uh, kind of um, um, uh, you know go through this embalming process which is um, which is against you know even our scholars here ulama they keep telling you don't need to transport anything just you know uh, bury them at the place of uh, you know in the place of death you don't have to ship them to any other place or any other uh, state so these are key things that I wanted to uh, bring to the attention um, uh, are the ones to uh, remember do's and don'ts. The next one I have here is the basic process here. So as soon as the funeral home or me gets an information about a deceased person, we, we get the, all the information. Um, the funeral home is going to send a transportation to either a coroner's home or a hospital to pick the deceased and bring them to the masjid. And while the, the deceased is in the masjid, uh, you know, the funeral home is going to contact your doctor. So it's very important to have the doctor in the loop because, uh, and to also uh, let him know that, uh, that he's going to get a call from the funeral home. You know, if you, if you don't have your doctor ready, uh, you know, uh, the janaza, the ghusl cannot ha happen the same day. It will have to be postponed. They have, you have to put, put the deceased in the morgue for a couple of days. So you want to make sure the doctor is always on the picture and he is uh, notified. And this way, the janaza can, the ghusl can happen and the janaza can happen on the same day. So here in Bay Area, we make it a point. If it comes at eight in the morning, night, we do it on the same day till uh, one. So it's very key to have the doctor in loop. If doctor is on surgery, on vacation, now uh, you are not able to get the burial permit and we can't do ghusl and, 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 and the disease can't be buried. So it's very critical that the doctor is informed and he should be aware to pick the call from the funeral home because the key thing is the cause of death. So, so, one, so it's without a cause of death from the doctor certifying, uh, the county or the state cannot issue a burial, burial permit. So it's very okay. important. I, I was just curious, um, and I'm not as familiar, but maybe if you know, or even Brother Munir, if you know, um, are there resources um, in the community? Because um, these are big costs and are, 
uh, they're reasonable, but they, they, they can be cost. Are there resources that for people can turn to if they can't afford these costs? Um, does the community have resources to help people? Yeah, all, all, yeah, all of our websites. All of our web so all of our websites have uh, a link. Uh, so I can share the link uh, from our website here in, in the Bay Area. Right. So so as soon as, uh, it basically this, as soon as you you know hear anyone deceased, you go to our website, funeral service, and you have contact numbers. So we are here, three of us, the Imam, myself, always there 24 by seven to pick up the calls. And we want to make sure that the janaza, the ghusl happens, and the janaza happens at the very same time on the same day, and he gets uh, gets buried. Yeah, and and, if, and, uh, and also we do get calls that someone is sick there in the last stage. What what should we do? And those are the times we quickly, uh, you know, go visit them. Some and we tell them this is what is needed, especially you know when they are in hospitals. You have all these tubes uh, that are uh, that are uh, you know put into your body. We tell them to make sure the nurses there are there to take those out before, you know, uh, before or after their demise, basically. So those those kind of pointers, we let them know. We also uh, have the, the paperwork, the details for filling up those forms available on the website. And also we have mobile uh, apps where you can fill in those information. And this all happens within four hours. As soon as a person uh, calls me and uh, you know tells me uh, there is a, there is a deceased person. Uh, it takes two hours to uh, to transport them to the masjid, and uh, if you know ahead of time, we tell them you know you know make sure the doctor is aware of uh, aware of this if you want to expedite the burial. Yeah, it's great that alhamdulillah that there are resources out there to help people, and I will say especially as people that if we do have a place of privilege is. Uh, to really set aside these costs in advance, as we were putting together wills, um, set aside money like this. So if a funeral is going to cost um, roughly around six, uh, seven, eight thousand dollars, is set that money aside. Maybe it's a hundred dollars every year, or this and that. Like if we buy sneakers that cost this much, like we should be setting this money aside because let's not worry about our kids and our future loved ones to take care of that. Set that money aside now. Create an account. Move that aside, and so that that is taken care of because it's great that humble that there are resources out there for uh families that can't afford these during very turbulent times but we also don't want to strain those resources as well we want to make sure those resources are for emergency purposes for people that truly 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 are in dire space so if we can lessen that burden on these resources let's set that money aside and so that's something that i can't uh stress enough as well yeah and let me just say uh this is munir uh, that whenever there is someone, we call it the Indigent Muslim Fund. So the San Ramon Mosque and the MCC in Pleasanton, we both have a joint fund where we cover the cost and we have a, a financial kind of a form application. And we ask for cost sharing from the family because it is a limited fund. And uh, we usually do four or five a month uh, of, of folks that cannot be buried by and, um, and then MCA has a fund as well. So we, with between the, the th three organizations, we're able to cover pretty well, but it is a limited fund. So um, it's important for folks to have some savings. And we do ask that as well, if you could contribute anything towards the uh, the cost. So we don't, we're not covered the complete burden of the cost uh, using community funds. Yeah. And we're not here to, to do a fundraiser today, but yeah, it is important to support uh, initiatives like this because when families are grieving, um, the last thing you want to think about is, do I have to work a couple extra hours? How am I going to pay for this? Um, it's really, really, really overwhelming. And so if we are in places of privilege uh, to not only think about our own funerals, but to help other families make their lives easier, um, it's definitely something worth considering. And may Allah um, reward each and every one of you uh, for stepping up because this is super, super, uh, super difficult for many families. And it's great that there are resources out there to help people. Yeah. And mashallah, you know, MCC does a lot. Our masjid also has some funds, but, you know, I mean, if you look at the cost here, the, the basic funeral services. So basically, um, as soon as the doctor is heard, uh, you know, uh, states the cost of death, you get a burial permit. Um, so the funeral home is going to charge around $2,000 here. And what it does is transportation, uh, get this uh, burial permit, and then the hearse to take it to the cemetery. Um, so so that's, that's around $2,000. At the cemetery, this is Five Pillars Farm, which is a Muslim-owned cemetery here in the Bay Area, which is in uh, uh, Nevermore. 
Um, the, the adult burial cost is $5,900. And for a child, uh, it's uh, $2,500. And if it's a week, uh, weekend or a holiday, it's going to be $500 uh, more. Um, Brother Abdurrahman, a question that just came up, and I think you touched base on it earlier, but if you can spell out a little bit more, um, what is a funeral home compared to the function at the masjid? Like if I lose a loved one, do I contact the funeral home? What role does the funeral home play? And what role does people like yourself and the masjid play? Yeah, exactly. So that's a good question. So here, we the funeral home is not exposed at all. It's always the masjid. So the first call that comes is, is the masjid from the link. And uh, there are three contact numbers or four contact numbers. And the call comes to us first. And, they, and, and the family don't even have to worry about the funeral home at all. All they have to do is uh, give us the information or there's a mobile app, just fill that uh, information and the rest, we, we make sure, you know, the funeral home is on top of it. We make sure the transportation is happening within two hours and we make sure the gusul happens in the masjid. So all that happens in the masjid is coordination and a gusul facility. Uh, by the way, the MCA masjid does have a funeral director. So sometimes we work with the MCA masjid in Santa Clara to get the, uh, get the burial permit. Um, but other than that, the family, all they have to do is work with the, the imam or the volunteers. And, uh, and, and, and the website is there to update them as well. Uh, and they also get emails, you know. So, so the, basically, our Lauri masjid has a gusul facility. And that's what happens in our masjid. And we coordinate with the funeral home. Uh, at the end of the day, they pay us. We pay the, the funeral home $2,000. We give them the invo invoice as well. As far as the symmetry is concerned, uh, the individual has to pay the symmetry directly. And here, it's going to be a cashier's check or a cash. You know, uh, no, no, no check. So, so symmetry, they directly take the, uh, the cashier's check and, uh, and pay, pay the symmetry five pillars. And it's and going to be for $5,000. A question that's came up is, can you post a link in the chat um, to everyone uh, sure. for the website you mentioned and the phone number to contact? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so basically here, uh, the, sum, uh, the, uh, the cost is $7,900 to $8,400 if it's a weekend, you know, and for a child, it's almost $5,000. Um, so what, what it basically takes in the symmetry, right? What basically takes you know, what are the costs that goes into that 5,900 from what I um, am aware of is basically here in California, every uh, grave, uh, you will, if you see the picture here, grave liner. So every grave has a grave liner. But in this picture, right, the top part, the top part is not going to be there. It's just from, from this part all the way to the bottom where you will see the, uh, the, 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 the mud. So you see, it's it's just an outliner, and then there is an uh, a top cover. Uh, all these are made of uh, concrete. So so th so this is laid on every grave, just because of the uh, the law in California, because of the earthquakes and stuff like that. So those are mandatory ones. Um, the 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 grave sites itself cost two thousand dollars per per site here, and the rest of the three thousand nine hundred goes to this grave liner endowment fee, the lid, the marker. So every grave has a marker, just name and the date. And then the opening and the closing of the grave cost. So they all cost $3,900. And then you have, oh, so these are the main two costs. Most of the time, right, here in Bay Area, we use only a cardboard carrier, which is free to carry uh, the deceased with the you know, coffin inside. So when, when uh, so we don't, so this is called also called casket, but this is not lowered with the deceased, you know. So we just take the, the, the person, the deceased person and lower him in, onto the grave. We don't use any other casket, but recently I've seen people using, like Brother Hanif, who makes caskets. Uh, I've seen two or three lately where some families demand that they want their, uh, you know, dear ones to be buried in a wood wooden casket, which is around $500. It could be yeah, like it very, yeah, it varies state by state. Actually, in New Jersey, the law requires people to be buried in a box, and that's why that's the only reason why people yeah. are placed in a box. So it's super simple. Yeah, that's that's correct here as well. Actually, there are two couple of symmetries like the lone tree, and a couple of other. They mandate them to be in the wooden caskets. You know. 
So, but whereas with five pillars, which is a Muslim run uh, cemetery, uh, we, there is no such requirement. So, so all, all, all we do is carry the deceased after, after coffin uh, into the uh, cardboard box, and then we take them near the grave, lift the body and place him inside the, uh, the grave. So, um, so this is the basic uh, coffin, which I will go in, 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 into the practical part in a bit. Basically for men, we use three uh, you know, pieces of unstitched cloth. One is like a shirt, kameez. Um, one is a izar, like a lungi. And then right. the, the, for those the, who don't know what a coffin is, can you explain what the what the shrouding of it is? Okay. Yeah, this is basically uh, we shroud after the gusul, after the body bath. Uh, we shroud every deceased one with the. So the sunnah is uh, the three piece of unstitched cloth, and this is just a. Uh, so one one has a slit here. There's a back that looks like a shirt. There's a back part and the front part with the slit for the neck. And then there is a, 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 the biggest piece, which is at the bottom. And then you have one for the, for the trouser side, you know, the izar. So these are the basic things. And this is the facility of, at our masjid. If you look at here, this is Lauri Masjid in Fremont, Islamic Society of East Bay. So we have a facility of uh, three mogs here. Um, so at any point of time, we have, we have seen many, many, many times three deceased and we do three janazas in a day at a time. And then we have this one, uh, some, someone, sometime, uh, you know, uh, a large, for a large person, we use these to, to lift and lower. And basically this is the table where we, uh, you know, uh, where we lay the, the deceased and do the gusul. So basically you, uh, this is the table, there's a hole and there, and there are these, uh, um, um, what do you call lines to let the water run through at the end of it and get into the sink. Uh, and you have water and these have vents, ventilation, and uh, you know, the room, rooms are kept clean. So, and after every uh, gusul, uh, we have someone come in and, and, and it costs $150. So sometimes we also ask, the masjid also ask a donation, at least $150, just because it takes that much to clean up, you know, after every uh, gusul. So, so this is the basic picture. Uh, so that's all I have at this point. Uh, there's a couple of questions. Um, yeah, again, if you can post the, obviously in a little bit, if you can post the, the link to the website you mentioned, the phone number. Somebody asked about, is there a place in the Livermore Cemetery dedicated for Muslims or are all religions? Well, that is dedicated to Muslims. And, and, and there are many other cemeteries which are Christian runs uh, they have a portion of the cemeteries which are uh, Muslim ones. So there is a designated area within that which is Muslim ones. Uh, and obviously those will cost more, uh, you know, um, and it can go to two, three thousand dollars more. It could be even fourteen thousand dollars. You know, we are talking about eight and a half thousand dollars here. Uh, that could be around fourteen thousand dollars, you know. So, so there is there is also one in Sacramento, which is two and a half hours away from the Bay Area up north. That that is also a, a, a Muslim-owned cemetery, and that is a little bit cheaper because it's out of the Bay Area, um, and for the local people there, it's 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 cheaper as well. But uh, but for people from the Bay Area, it's going to cost cost a, cost a, a bit more. So, so what we plan next is, you know, so as soon as, you know, a deceased comes in, uh, you know, we prepare him for the gusul. So there are two aspects to it. The gusul is basically washing. So every deceased is given a gusul to, you know, purify him. Uh, and then they are shrouded. And then they, they are put in the cardboard uh, casket. And then at, uh, after Zohar, uh, the janaza prayer is led. And then they are taken by the hearse to the, the cemetery. Um, so if, if we are ready, then we can go jump into the, uh, the gusul as well as, uh, I mean, the washing as well yeah. as the shrouding. Let's do that. In the meantime, Brother Munir, if you can send that, I think you accidentally sent those links to just uh, the panelists. Can you send that to everybody in the chat? If you just select where it says two to everyone, you can send those links. Those are okay. great resources. Thanks. Sorry, I have this video uh, presentation as well as. <laughs> Uh, I, I could post. Uh, so Munir, is it uh, from the Lauri Masjid or? Um, I'm putting on the MCC webpage okay. and then it links to the Lauri Masjid website. Okay, perfect. 
go ahead with your demonstration if you like. Oh, okay. Um, so is that okay, Aman? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to um, uh, use my mobile phone. And so basically what we are going to do, so what happens is uh, as soon as the disease, sometimes the, the disease come in, the, uh, you know, directly when they come in, they are laid over the table. If it is over a previous night, we store them in this morgue. And next day morning, we uh, so we generally encourage the family members. I personally encourage all the family members to participate because the hadith said uh, the hadith says a person who involves in the ghost, like Brother Hanif mentioned, forty major sins are forgiven. Um, but in, in addition to that, whatever we see, you know, uh, of the deceased, we have it is it's obligated upon us to keep it as amana. We are not supposed to share any kind of imperfections, you know, lost limb you know, uh, bloodshot wounds uh, or any kind of an autopsy things to, to reveal it to any spouse or, you know, that's a key aspect of uh, giving a gusul is, is to keep it to yourself till you die. Uh, any kind of an imperfections or uh, shortcomings of the disease that we see and then participate in the gusul you know, 40 major sins are forgiven. And and I and uh, Tamim, we are here all the time, you know, just to take advantage of those you know, blessings, you know. And 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 the, and the key thing is no recitation of Quran uh, in the Ghusl area. Uh, we all do wudu and come in. We make sure we have all our uh, aprons and uh, PPE, you know, if it is a COVID, post-COVID, we make sure we have PPE uh, 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 kit, uh, you know, we wear them. We wear gloves, aprons, and um, you know, uh, head head covering as well as the shoe covering, all those, and we make sure, uh, you know, uh, one dua that we allow or let people know is, Allahumma kfir lahu wa Allah forgive the deceased. You know, we also make make it a point to tell ourselves, Allahumma kfir li wa Allah forgive us. Apart from that, no recitation of Quran. Once the kusul is complete and the the washing and the shrouding, we take them into a uh, room where we allow the mehrams to uh, view the deceased and then we cover the head. So those are the basic things. And one other key thing is the satar. Satar is, uh, is you know, modesty is very key uh, in, uh, in the Islam, uh, Islamic religion. So, so for men, the satar is the area between navel to below the knee. So that area of, of the deceased is always, is always closed. Anything we do, we do under the hood, under the covers of that area from the start to finish. So the first thing what we do is, as if it, if it is hospital, it's going to be a hospital bag. Uh, if, it's, if it's a COVID case, it's going to be a double bag. Um, sometimes it comes from home with uh, clothes. So what we do is we cover the satar. We're going to show in a second, uh, cover the satar and undo all the clothes. And also we make it a point if we can remove any kind of uh, wearables like watch, rings that are easily removable we do that uh, some people have uh, uh, the teeth sets uh, if there is no rigor mortis set in you know and if it is easy to take out the you know the false teeth we we take that as well so those are a couple of key things we don't let anyone uh, cut nails or cut hair uh, none of those sort you know and and all these things removable remove removables you know only if it is easily retrievable or taken out if it is okay. not we leave it yeah i want to be mindful of time so inshallah we can go ahead uh, okay. so brother abdurrahman is just going to switch cameras real quick um and get the demo to show you all what the um the the washing process looks like um, assume that this is the deceased and uh, i have him on the table and um, you know it has a you know the uh, it has some coverings probably so the first thing what we do is and we we lay him down on the so by the way the Qibla for the deceased, you know, or the, the living and the dead, as Prophet ﷺ said, is Kaaba. So we make sure that the, the person is laid in such a way that the right side of his is facing uh, the, the Qibla, the Kaaba side. So that's very, we make it a point. And then before starting Ghusl, we make, give them, make an intention of giving Ghusl to the Mayat or the deceased to purify him and uh, to also... Uh, fulfill the obligation as well as uh, according to the sunnah and for the sake of Allah. So with those intentions and with those, uh, uh, you know, the things that I mentioned before about no Quranic recitation and those things, we start off undoing the clothes. So before undoing the clothes, uh, I have Brother Tamim here. So what we do is quickly, we have two uh, towels. We just lay down um, 
uh, two towels. Uh, there's another one as well. So we make sure, like I said, the satar. Satar is the area between the navel and, and below the knee. So that area we make sure is covered all the time. And so one vertically. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, so this way, uh, one horizontally. So we make sure the satar is covered and basically we undo the clothes. What we do is basically unzip, uh, if it is a hospital bag or it, um, any, any kind of a thing, what we do is unzip everything. If you need, we turn him on his left or right, make sure each and everything is taken out of, uh, the, of the deceased with the, with the satar covered. We also make it a point, any kind of tubes, you know, tubings, uh, we take the consent, I mean, we, we ask the family members if they can take it out on our behalf because we are no experts here while doing this. So that's why we tell if they are uh, in the hospital to take out all those tubes and stuff away uh, after, after they have deceased the hospital. Uh, so we undo the clothes, any kind of patches, bed sores. If, if it is very hard to take it out, we'll, we, we let it stay there. But any kind of a thing like a bandage or anything, we make it a point to take it out with all this. And one key thing is, again, when we have the satar covered, whatever we do, we make sure that we don't gaze at the private parts of the individual at no point of time. All the time we have our gaze down and we start off with this. And the first thing what we do like, and this gusul, gusul is washing. This gusul washing is very similar to our juma gusul uh, that we give for our juma or any, any kind of a gusul that we give. Basically there are three parts to it, you know, the first thing we do is, uh, before doing that, the first thing we do is to uh, wash the private parts. So the private parts, and then any other area which is, um, it's, which is which has filth, we make it a point to clean all those first. And that is exactly what we do even in Juma Gosul. And second thing is uh, the uh, Vodhu. Vodhu is the second thing which we do. And the third one is a body bath. And, and one key thing is we always start from the right and then do the left. So these are the three major parts in a gusul, which is very similar to what we do with our gusul for Juma or any other gusul. So the first thing what we do is istinja, is to wash the private parts. Assume that the, the deceased is completely taken off the cloth. It's just the satar himself and the satar covered. The first thing we do is lift him up and lift him up to the shoulder a bit and press his abdomen three times. So this way, the bowel, uh, we put uh, all the muscles on the bowel, make sure that all impurities come out of the, of the disease. So that's the first step before we start with istinja. So for istinja, the rule is we make it a point. If you see there, there are many small clothes like this where we tie wrap around. We make it a point that the hand doesn't feel the private parts. And, and so we use small turkey towels like this and we soak it in water and we use soap as well. And there are a few brothers, at least five or six around us to hold those towels up. So he's holding one. So he puts his hand down and make sure the front part of the, of the private part is washed. So we do this and throw away those towels. We use as many as small towels are, are needed to clean the private uh, on the front of the private part. And also I make it a point to make sure that the groin area, because these are the hard areas, make sure that those areas are also uh, washed and cleaned until they find, they feel good about, about this. Now, as soon as the top part and the, and the groin is done, we, we, we tilt him or the deceased to the left so that the right side of the, the private area from the back is, is cleaned. So you turn him, you move the towels a bit to the other side so that you don't, uh, are not able to see the private parts. Now you lift one of the leg here so you have some clearance. So you reach out under the satar to wash the backside of the private part. So we make sure we do that. We again, throw away as many uh, small clothes we need, uh, throw away. And the same thing, he will come over this side or if I'm on this side, I make it a point to do it from the backside from this side. So th this way, both the front and also once the backside of the private part is cleaned up, I make it a point also make sure that the lower back and other hard areas are also cleaned. So at this point, the first step after pressing the abdomen, the istinja will be complete. And in addition to that, then before going to the second step, which is the vodu, we make, we make it a point, you know, sometimes there are a lot of bloods, blood and other fluids coming out of the mouth and nose. 
and stuff like that. So we make it a point to use a cotton swab to just clean up all those nasal. So we just take a, um, so the brother here has a cotton. So he will wet it up with the cotton and just clean up the nose, uh, the left side of the nostril, the right side of the nostril, take out any blood or any of those that is there on the, on the face, the ears as well. And sometimes uh, because of the rigor mortis, you can't open the mouth wide. So we also make it a point to just um, swab, use a cotton swab to uh, wipe with the, the lips as well and the teeth as well. Um, so those are the part of the istinja where the, you know, all the dirt is, is uh, cleaned up. So that's number one. Now comes uh, the wudu. The second part uh, is the wudu. So we, um, so, we do, so we start with the right, we just wash the palms, the right palm three times and the left palm uh, three times. The farai the vadu is done. Basically, the farai the vadu is washing the face three times between ear lobe to ear lobe, from the top to the bottom of the beard, every nook and corner of the face three times. Then we do the right arm till the. Uh, so let's let's go and do it. So so we're going to do uh, take water, uh, and and if and we want to make sure the water doesn't go into the nostrils into the body. So sometimes we cover the nose uh, with our um, uh, palm. And then we make sure that, uh, you know, three times uh, the, the, the face is uh, washed. So that's the taking care of the wudu, the face part, which is the farait. And then we make sure uh, the kilal of the fingers, all the, the fingers between the fingers are, are washed three times, uh, all the way to the elbow, below the elbow of the right. So always we start with the right, and then we go to the left. So we started the face with the right, and then we go to the, the left side of the, you know, the hand all the way to the elbow three times. And the water we use is lukewarm water. So it's similar to what we take shower with. We feel good about the water. So we make it a point that it is a mixed hot and cold. And so it is good for the. So once that is done, the masa, masa of the head is done. So we make sure the masa of the head is one time is enough for this. So, uh, and some people can also extend it to go all the way to the ears. And finally, we come to the, to the leg, uh, ankle. We, we again kill all of the fingers from the right. So the sunna way is from the, the right side and you go all the way to the left side. So you do the kilal of the fingers and also uh, wash the ankles three times and same thing with the right leg and same thing with the left leg. So this basically completes the second part. So after istinja, we are then uh, with the, uh, with the, um, uh, yeah. The third one is uh, we have to, uh, so now if you want to change uh, before doing the wudu, if this gets dirty, we change them. Now we go to the final giving a bath all we do is three times a water, water bath. Uh, we start, uh, we, before giving a bath, we make sure we close the, the nose and the ears. We plug it in with the, with the, the cotton. We also uh, cover the, the mouth and also the ears. And then we start with the body bath. The body bath basically is the right side. You have a right side body bath uh, uh, three times and with the hand under the arms, everything. Then we turn him around. And, and give a bath on the back side, on the right side, and then we do the same thing with the left, and we complete the left. So this basically, and after this, we press the abdomen once again. The vadu is not necessary after that. We do that again, that completes. And the last is with the camphor. We have camphor is um, some kind of an aromatic uh, stuff that we put in the water, and we, we run, run through him three times, and that completes the gusul. All that is, that completes the gusul. And basically what we use is some kind of a camphor here tablets, we just crush them and put it in the water. It gives that aromatic. So this completes the uh, the washing, and uh, we now dry them up. Um, so so once we dry them up, we go to the uh, kafan. So um, so is that okay now to go to the kafan part, Raman? Or... Yeah, we got about two or three minutes left. I want to give time. There's a couple questions that came in, but yeah, if you want to. Okay. So what we're going to do is, you know, like I said, there are three pieces of uh, clothes. There's a big one, that's a small one, that's a small one. So, so there are three big, uh, there are going to be three big clothes, not this one, other one. Okay, this is a big one. Okay. So we lay out the bigger cloth. So like I said, this is an unstitched piece of cloth, three, three big cloths. So we just lay out the, the top one. Um, and then we, we, we have a, a, the, the trouser part. Sorry. Trouser, not one. So you can see the slit here. Can you show the slit? Yeah. yeah. So if you see here, basically, there's a slit here, and that's where the head is going to come. There's the top part of the 
of the of the of the shirt and then you have the you have the the izar so I, i think we are almost done we'll just place the mannequin here and we'll just wrap him around just put it quickly that's it right and i know we're covering a lot today by the way um we will be sharing this recording as well as additional resources we know there's so much to to talk about and things to take away from this and so yes we will gladly send each and every one of yeah. you so once it is dried up once we have dried up you know with the satar is still covered you know so you see here the head the shirt the top part of the shirt which is uh you know the kameez that comes on top and at this point you know if there is ifter we put the ifter on the body as well and then we with the satar covered we can take out the two uh, the two uh, turkey towels and we have changed the turkey towels couple of times once it gets dirty so we have the satar still covered and the next one is the left side of the the izar is let's wait quickly 2 minutes so what we're going to do is just wrap around this put it on the leg and then we have the right side which goes on top so we have these two together and then the the outermost is the is the biggest one so beneath this there are three uh, tie ropes so basically we tie the leg side the mid section and the and the head side so with this said you know um we the, the, the thing that i try to tell the family is what ha- what comes next is the three questions you know that 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 is that is asked in the cover in the burial and that is key and i tell all the family members to you know prepare themselves to be in a position to answer those three questions the mar rabbuka ma dinuka man nabiyuka this is the question asked in the burial at the in the burial by the munkar and nakir and so it's very important for us to say because our mouth is not going to speak it's our conviction on those things that's going to um because the life of the hereafter is from the burial you know from the once the person is buried that's when the life of the hereafter starts so i think that completes the wrapping and we show uh the the face for the uh, the mehrams and then we tie them so there's a tie rope at the bottom we cover the the mid section the leg and the head so that completes yeah jazakallah khair that is uh tremendous and again we will share this recording it's a lot it's a lot to process and the good thing is um these aren't things that inshallah that we'll have to do by ourselves there there volunteers and massages and funeral homes and other places that will walk uh people uh through it i, I want to get to a couple of questions and one for you brother abdurrahman um is uh the uh we were talking about who can be in the room what about in a, in a mahram and a non mahram case so if there is a female body on the table and let's say it's my sister in law on the table as a technically a non mahram to that person can i look at the person's face who's allowed to see the face of the people that are deceased on the table yeah after the shrouding right after the shrouding you know the mehrams are generally the mehrams are allowed to see but it is it's a decision of the family you know if you ask a scholar they are going to say it's not allowed for for non mehram to see you know but but for ultimately it is the family's call there you know some some are there to you know get their video started to share with someone out in in a different part of the world and stuff like that so we tell them we tell them after this is to you know it's safe not to you know you know sort of gair mehram you know it's because it's it's about the individual who passed away he wants to make a you know safe transition into the cover into the hereafter because he's waiting to you know uh, go through the bliss the, the the bliss of the of the you know grave and uh, you know all those things and he doesn't want something like this to not uh, <laughs> not happen but it, the call is ultimately the families you know great a uh, lot of questions coming in i want to be mindful of time again we thank you all so much for uh taking the time on a beautiful saturday uh afternoon uh to have this very very important uh conversation and so definitely give yourself the space and the uh um and the credit for for doing that a great question that came in um from arwa um listening to dr rami's presentation earlier on the song perspective on death and dying seems to fit very well with the hospice philosophy uh of end of life care however there's a lot of families for whatever reason um may not have the same uh embracing of it uh they may have misconceptions um how do you dr ami how do you think uh the hospice philosophy of end of life care fits with the islamic perspective uh of dying 
Yeah, I think you don't have to turn any further than the Sunnah. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was the best example on how to live. And that includes to the very last moment that he uh, was on this earth. And if you looked at the last 14 days, roughly, um, of his life and how he was dealing with illness, I think you can learn all that you need to know about what would be important for us as Muslims at the end of life. I think he, he provided us the perfect manual. And hospice, just to introduce it to people who don't know, is a approach to care. It's not an actual place. Most hospice is actually provided at home, at a person's um, own home, where everything is geared towards comfort. So people on hospice don't have, uh, don't want to see the inside of a hospital again, keep me as comfortable as possible for whatever time might be left. And I would say from an Islamic standpoint, if there were any more honorable way to die than at home, and in the arms of your loved one, then the Prophet Sallallahu would have died that way. He died in, uh, on his wife's bosom, on Aisha anha, speaking with her, seeing his family members and, and community members in and out. Um, and it, that was important in the last days of his life. And we should do our best to emulate it. Now, it's a packed question because a lot goes into making the transition to hospice from a medical standpoint. I think it's the onus is on doctors to have good communication about health status, prognosis, treatment options, et cetera. Uh, also to have families to figure out what's important for a person, um, you know, at the end of life. But I do think that uh, Islam and the hospice philosophy go hand in hand. I may be biased because I'm in this field, but yeah. Yeah. And again, more reason to have these conversations when people are happy and healthy, um, and ask what their preference is. Um, and there's actually great resources out there. I do want to shout out, let me see if I can bring them up real quick. Um, let me just load this up. I know we're tight on time. Um, there's a website, shariawiz.com. Um, they help you put together um, legally certified, legally certifiable Islamic wills in all 50 states uh, for a hundred bucks. And they actually... Um, are hundred bucks is great. And so you literally go online and ask you a bunch of questions. Um, you can put together, um, healthcare directives. Um, I think that one is like 59 bucks. Um, and it's certifiable and you can change it as you go. So let's say in a few years you decide, okay, I don't want to use this anymore. Uh, they're a great resource. Uh, and they actually, um, and I'll post them in the chat, but they actually gave us a promo code of uh, two gods. So for a 20% discount, so instead of hundred bucks, it's 80 bucks and that's a will. You can spell this all out saying, put me in a hospice. Um, don't intubate me if, if something like this happens or do intubate me or do this or that. Or I want these people uh, in the room uh, during a janazah. You can spell that all out uh, in a will so that um, your family and your, fu your future loved ones don't have to fight and argue uh, over this. And so I definitely recommend no matter what your age is, start thinking about these things and, and document those because these can be very, very emotional and explosive things. And it's important uh, to address that. Uh, Brother Abdur Rahman, a question that came in, um, you had mentioned that um, there is baraka in keeping the body washing private, not to talk about um, what you see in the room. And actually in our film, we, if you, for those who have seen the documentary, we actually, even though we have consent of the families, we don't show faces. We don't show any kind of marks that reveal who that person is to respect the people's uh, privacy and family. Um, what are your thoughts on, um, let's say a family member can't make it or a family member overseas, um, if somebody FaceTimes them or puts the body washing uh, on Zoom, um, is that okay? Or what, what are your, I'm sure that's come up before where somebody wants to show loved ones. Um, what, what do you recommend in a situation like that? Uh, you're on mute, brother. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Um, so I have seen, I mean, most of the families don't encourage, but I have seen uh, um, instances where one of the brother or the son is in UK. And uh, so there was a FaceTime that was going on with uh, during the Gusul. So except for the immediate family members who are away and it is son of the, you know, uh, a son who is away from home, I've seen otherwise in most of the cases, you know, we don't encourage uh, FaceTime or uh, anything within, you know, external uh, set of people. But most of the time, it's just the immediate families, their son, 
the father, the brother, or the immediate family members are uh, have need to participate, and they are more than happy um, to not share with anyone. But I have seen instances where you know, for the you know other son or the brother who couldn't make it, you know, a FaceTime was allowed, or you know, it's again the family thing. You know, we tell them it's it's the family who is going to make the call there. You know.